Okay, so we've already talked a little bit um, prior to lunch about user interfaces, but we're really going to dive in deeply and talk about redefining the user interface. So this is um, going to be specifically about user interfaces and how they're relevant for intelligent assistance and kind of how they've evolved and where, where the panelists think they might be going. So I'm going to ask um, each person to just briefly introduce himself and tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and how that maybe relates to user interfaces. Hi, I'm Mark Stephen Meadows. I'm president of Botanic. And we develop graphical bots. We consider user experience to be personality and the avatar to be an element of the graphical user interface. Um, we're a small company of eight weaponized designers and uh, we basically working uh, where we help folks design the personalities. We provide a lot of back-end licensing. Uh, technology, and then um, I'm also participating in a committee of I within, um, in which we're developing a wellness system. So, you know, by trade, I'm a virtual reality designer, uh, about 20 years in VR, about 15 in AI and NLP, been dabbling in blockchain for a couple of years now, and thank you very much for having me here. Tobias Goebel, uh, Director of Emerging Technologies at Aspect. Been in the uh, contact center and customer care technology space for about 13 years now. Um, and uh, we help companies realize that customer service is not necessarily about coming up with particular forms of user interfaces, but it's about abstracting your business functions into services, breaking down your business functions into services, into actions that customers can do, and then design these services in such a way that they can be deployed on any channel you want. That's what Aspect uh, is working on these days. And a lot of other things. But come on. So I'm Brian Garr uh, with Cognitive Code, and I like long walks on the beach, <laughs> sunsets. Oh, I'm sorry. So, 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 so Cognitive Code uh, is an AI firm. We've been around for almost 10 years. Um, and we take a very different approach on, shh, good God. Answer, we, take, answer it. we take a very different approach on artificial intelligence in that we uh, look at it from an experiential standpoint. So you may have been by our, our booth and, and met Sophie or Gracie or one of our, our talking characters. Uh, and so while we can certainly do transactions, our goal is to make the experience of the, of the end user enlightening, uh, fantastic, enjoyable, something they want to do again. Uh, even though we're feeding them a lot of the same data that everybody else is feeding them, there's different ways to do it. We just take a different view on things than a lot of people. My name is Christian Peterson. I'm a director of product at uh, Comcast Silicon Valley Innovation Center. Um, I have teams focused on personalization and personal media. Um, one of the things we're trying to solve is how can we best help you decide what to watch on TV? And we think conversation UI uh, could be perfect for that. Um, really focusing on you as an individual or if you're sitting two in the living room, uh, solve that problem and basically have a conversation with you about what to watch. Okay, thanks. So just to get us started, I'm going to ask the panel to kind of define what are the different types of user interfaces that we have currently that support intelligent assistance. So you don't have to go into like a ton of depth, but just let's kind of name what you guys think the, the pertinent user interfaces are that relate to intelligent assistance. assistance. Uh. Um, let me start maybe. Um, I like to think of it in kind of three major categories. There's, there's voice-based interfaces, there's textual interfaces, and there's graphical interfaces. Um, and I think you can break down pretty much any um, approach that's in use today in broad use. There's you know, more, there's gestural, there's eye tracking, that type of stuff. But interfaces that are in use today, you can break down into one of these three. Um, so voice could be an IVR call. That's an intelligent assistant, right? It's, it's intelligent when, when it tries to mimic what a human does, right? A cognitive task of a human, which is speak language. Um, or it could be voice on Amazon Echo, 
right? It's another platform on which to deliver voice. Text could be something like SMS or USSD, could be Messenger, Twitter, Line, Viber, Kick, Snapchat, KakaoTalk, QQ, Tencent, WeChat, WhatsApp, you name it. Uh, graphical is interesting because graphical is, you know, things like web, mobile, maybe kiosk terminals. So how is that a conversation or how is that a dialogue? I think it is because you're still breaking down the interaction into kind of turns that you take between the system and the user, right? The dialogue is about turn taking. I say something, you listen, you say something and I listen and so forth, so we're taking turns. Even a visual graphical a GUI is a dialogue in the sense that it prompts me for my account number and PIN, I hit submit, then it prompts me for the main menu, I select a menu item, it shows the next page. So every page is a dialogue step. If you think of it that way, I think you can break down the channels into these three groups. So I, t I tend to get very Darwinian about this. Um, we've been using speech for 60,000 years, sort of the way we learn to communicate. It's in, in our genes, it's inherent. Uh, certainly, this generation that we're, we're working with today likes texting, but if you think about the reason they like texting, it's because you don't have to go through the behavior of saying, hi, how are you? You know, what did you do yesterday? They want to get an answer. That's fine, that's fine, but uh, I think at the end of the day, texting is, when, when people understand that they can use an AI without the behaviors of saying hello and everything, then we still are in an era where keyboards are getting smaller and fingers are getting fatter. So uh, speech is, I think, for, for the, for, and, until we can actually do it with our minds, which I don't think is that far off, um, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be speech as the predominant interface, um, just from a scientific and Darwinian standpoint. All right, well, so let me, let me ask Christian a, a question. Over, if you think about the past couple of years, what do you think is the most interesting innovation within the world of UIs that's occurred like over the past couple of years what, and that seems the most compelling to you related to its, its um, you know, applications around intelligent assistance? So I think you know, one of the things that we, is, is pretty easy to, to see when you look at history is that technology doesn't happen with, you know, I get a good idea and you know, a year from now everybody uses it. Um, most of the technologies we're talking about on this conference is something people worked on for, um, I was about to say generations, but certainly um, for a long time. Um, and it just matures at a point where it's almost like not modern to talk about it anymore and suddenly it actually works and it's, and it's deployable by, by lots of businesses. And I think that's happening with, with, with all of these technologies. You know, on my team we're looking at, um, we need presence, we prefer to know um, roughly who's in, in, in the living room so that we can serve um, the right content, the right UX to what those people usually like when they're in the living room. We don't necessarily know who it is. That's not important for us. It's more a matter of recognizing a user. And it's the same thing with, with conversation. The, the strange thing about going to a website like Amazon, which is obviously has you know, started this whole thing of being a smart website, there's definitely intelligence or artificial intelligence behind what you see on Amazon. But imagine if, if I met one of you and I just held up this whole this, you know, poster of things that we could talk about. That'd be a very weird way to start a conversation. <laughs> um, so it, what I like about conversation UI, and, and, and I think we're getting close to being able to do that, is per, per your point that it's, it's really how we've been communicating for you know, forever, or at least for a very long time. Um, and once computers can do that, we get past the whole thing of, hmm, I wonder if the user understands this. Because it's already defined what, what people understand, at least at, at, at a high level. Uh, whereas, for instance, right now we have the problem with our voice remote. You can use a voice remote now to control our set-top box and, and your TV experience, but you have to remember what you can say to it. Mm -hmm. right. And you know, we have, like I think, seven pages telling you what you can say to it. I tried to go through those seven pages, and afterwards I remembered one command. So right. it's just not a, a very efficient way to, to, to tell you what you can do. But if we can just have a conversation, then you already know how to do it. Right. We can fix that for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was a similar thing. I was, I was talking to, um, to Dave of, uh, the, of Amazon that in, in my experience with Alexa skills, it's, it's still kind of awkward to invoke a third-party skill because you have to know 
the exact invocation phrase, and a lot of times it's not an intuitive thing. So that's um, it's a little bit of a of a of a barrier to to get to some of those those skills. It, it and is. we just heard there are three thousand of them, so that doesn't make it easier. Yeah. And, and it comes down to, that actually shows the biggest problem. And I think the biggest problem is that, you know, it's, it's not a technology challenge as much as a design challenge and the human factor challenge. I mean, to answer your original question, I think the most innovative product that I've seen lately is the Amazon Echo. It's, to me, it's the most impressive device since the iPhone came out, which was in 2007. I've never seen a platform I was more excited about. So, um, I think, and I'm, yeah, let me just, um, yeah, yeah finish that thought on, on the, um, the interface. So there's no point if you try to impose, you know, if you try to tell the human, here's how you should be using natural language to talk to me. That's, that's a little contradictory because natural language means I use what I've learned since I was born, actually before I was born. I learned the phonetics of a language in the womb. I learned the language within the first four years and then I learned style. Now you're telling me how I should use that thing that I use every day, every hour, every minute of my life? It's not gonna work. And it's been tried, it's not gonna work. So the reason why the Echo works so well, I think, uh, and why the Siri and, and some of these don't yet, aren't yet quite there is because Amazon understands, um, they, they, they hired the right people, they understand how a man-machine interface design works and how important the human factor is you know, voice interfaces have existed before, but the way they did it in the home, where it's accessible by all in a kind of democratic fashion, uh, not speaker related, um, trying to figure out, you know, to help you, it's, it's very useful, but I find myself just using predominantly the skills that it came with. Right. I use maybe three or four, maybe two or three external skills of the 3,000. And I would argue that only 10 skills are useful and the remaining 2,990 are just BS. But just to yeah. jump in, sorry. There, there's an important thing, though, that I think we shouldn't overlook, which is that you knew those things to do with Amazon Echo. And even though it was, you were doing them with natural language, I find that the context may be the key to user interface, context and personality. Because we have to know why we're talking. If someone just walks up to me on the street, they're like, hi. I'm, like, I'm usually just like, I don't, I don't yeah. want to interact with them, right? right. But, if, but if I know that you're here and we both kind of geek out over this technology, we have that context that we can share, then I think we have a means of interfacing with each other. Regardless of the 60,000 year history, I think that we have to know what the context of interaction is True. with the system. Otherwise, you end up with a lot of systems like Siri, Amazon, that are built for doing anything with anybody at any time, and that sucks, because it doesn't- So, so, so let, me, let, me, let me jump in, because uh, one of the scariest things I heard the guy from Lexus, and he's a, um, supposed to be promoting Alexis. But one of the scariest things I heard him say was, we record everything. And he said that. He said, we record everything. So, you know, I, I saw a great speech by Janet Smith from um, my, uh, MasterCard, and she was talking about how we're moving authentication to the edge, because uh, if, if your fingerprints are stored in the cloud, it's hackable. Someone's going to take a million fingerprints and have access. So really, if you think about it, what we should be doing is moving AI to the edge so that the speech reco and the AI is on the device. It doesn't need to go into the cloud. The only thing I need to do in the cloud is go to yahoo.com's weather API and grab the weather report for you. And I don't have to worry about who's listening to me in the middle of the night. I don't have to worry about... You know, who, what's, what's happening to my recordings? Are they being analyzed? Are there, is a marketer somewhere saying, look, these 10,000 people asked about pizza, let me send them a, an ad. That's great for them, but it's not great for me. So uh, I put it out there that we should be moving AI to the edge. And the interface. So I think, I think that's, you know, I understand why you're saying that. I think it's very challenging because I think the context that, that was mentioned is really a combination of the conversation you have with the user and the other things the user is doing. We heard that earlier in the conference that you have to look across all the systems the users are interacting with. So, you know, for us it will be like what TV channels they're watching, uh, what, what um, systems or what content is available to them based on their subscription. So it's all of these different pieces, you know, how their internet connection is working, uh, the fact that it, 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 it wasn't working, uh, you know, uh, two days ago. All of that information is, is part of that conversation. So we're, we're and if the, the bot side. doesn't know about it, then right. the bot is stupid. But, um, but they can do that without my voice going to the cloud. Yes. So, I, you know, the way I heard what, what uh, 
the guy from Amazon uh, 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 said was that everything where you say Alexa something, that it goes to the cloud. Um, that is very different than, than everything you say in the living room, of course. Um, you know, we, we already certainly record uh, um, data on, on what you watch on our set-top boxes. That's how we can make good recommendations. Right. And you're right, we have to make sure that that is well-guarded uh, data. Um, and, and certainly, we haven't been hacked uh, yet. Um, uh, so, 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 so I understand that. But, but it also comes down to, you know, what is most interesting to, to, to hack? My, my credit card data or what I watch on TV? The only case that I know of where someone actually got access to what video someone watched was some, um, uh, I think it was politician or journalist, no, I think it was politician, where a journalist got access to what they rented at the video store. And therefore, there's a law today where we can't share what you watch with any other provider. So to kind of go back to, to a couple of things that were said, um, we're talking about the user interface, and we're talking about the, the the compelling use cases and the you know the ability of the user interface to help us achieve certain goals and it kind of seems like there you know conversational interfaces have been around and Siri you know Siri has been around but do you think that um, some of the capabilities around intelligence are actually making these user interfaces more valuable than they were in the past because you know you said Christian that. And Mark, you were saying like context. So you can, if if I've got this um, this conversational ability, it was always there, but now it's only because I have the the ability to know more about who I'm engaging with that makes it more compelling. You see what I'm saying? So I, I think that that you know there's too many definitions right now of what is uh, an intelligent bot. For me, it's basically behaving like a human and thinking like a computer. That's, that's my definition, and it's you know, one I made up because what else I can't, I have to have something to hold up to, you know, are we being smart or not. From a user's point of view, it's basically that it feels like a smart and helpful conversation. Uh, that's, that's how I define it. And, and basically, it starts with just remembering what we talked about you know, uh, two sentences ago. If you, if you don't know that, then I'm gonna stop talking to you. And that's the same way we, I, you know, I react to a human doing that. N next is basically remembering what we talked about last time we talked and preferably getting to know me and me getting to know you. And I think that's also what answers how we can learn more things to do with a bot is it's a relationship that we're evolving and the bot needs to basically have smartness in the back end that looks at that relationship and, and, and tries to steer it in a good direction and the same with every conversation. You know, it, it seems as though, regardless of whether it's a bot or an AI or a robot or whatever myth word we want to use, it's ultimately a tool, and we have to have task-driven, task completion metrics of measurements, whether it's successful or not. I mean, the, let's, let's be frank, the, there are so many tools out there that we don't really in this room know what we're talking about. At least I'm confused, even though I had the word intelligence. I don't know what that means, right? So what we do is we say, okay, who's our user? What kinds of things do they like? We do psychographics, demographics, anthro, figure out what they're going to be using the tool for. Is it a screwdriver? Is it a hammer? And then once we figure out what the use case is, then we begin to look at what the, what the user interface is so that, that way you can communicate what the value of the product and how to use it is to the end user. So I think we have to, like any conversational art, maybe the art of great conversation is listening more than talking. And perhaps all of us as designers, as we look at user interface, need to listen to who the users are, because if we're saying, we're going to pass the Turing test, and therefore we've got a great UI, I don't think it makes sense. I think we have to say, right. what's the context, and who's the user? Then we can design the system. I, I fully agree. And, and, and again, I think that's what Amazon got. <coughs> I was um, at a partner event um, a couple weeks ago in New York, and they told us a little about the history of how it came about, and they said, Back in 2010, they, set, they met with some executives and said, what could be the next big thing? And they looked at VR and said, no, that's not it. And then they came up with voice. Um, and you know, the top use case that I use it for and my wife use it for in, in our kitchen where the thing stands, uh, which is kitchen and living room together, um, is um, setting timers for cooking, converting units, because in America, for some reason, I'm, I'm from Germany, we, we took care of that. You guys are still listening. <laughs> um, converting units, playing music. Um, there's no intelligence needed for that. There's no history needed for that. But it's insanely useful to be able to do that with voice while you're having your hands full of flour and stuff while you're cooking and baking. So fitting in to 
into my day, into my life, is, is what they got right. And then for when they fail, applying humor and some other human techniques to recover from failure is another reason why they, why they succeed, another reason why Siri is also good. You know, we love messing with these assistants. We love asking them silly questions. Even though I know exactly how the tech works, I still do it for the fun of it. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Why am I doing it? Because I know exactly that it, there's not a being that enjoys having this conversation. It's a piece of tech. But still, I do it. And I wonder, why? Why, why do I? <laughs> oh, I'm a human being. And I, I, I'm a human being, and I love to converse. It's part of my DNA. It's what put us at the top of the food chain, right? And that machine is satisfying my need to converse. So I find myself talking to her when my wife's out. Isn't that the craziest thing? <laughs> but that's what they got right. So well, we, we take a different, as I mentioned at the top of, 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 the, of this session, we tend to take a different view of the world. Um, so if you go by our booth, you've probably seen, uh, as I said before, uh, Gracie or Sophie, which is um, a 3D VR character that we created. Uh, that knows all about her life. She knows where she goes to school. She knows her kids, uh, her friends' names, her best friend. She knows everything about her life, and that was one of our, our, our director of content wrote that. And, and so this character has no purpose in life other than entertaining a child. Um, but take that same interface and put it on a, uh, on, on, in the kitchen where you like to be for some reason. Um, and, and all of a sudden you have Julia Childs with you and, and you want to learn how to make that, what is it, bone marrow gel of some sort that she made in the movie and, and all of a sudden you've got a friend there who can interface with you, it's a terrible word to use, who can speak to you <laughs> and actually help you through the process of making this bone marrow gel which is incredibly difficult to make according to the movie anyway. So. Yeah, so, so, so that's where I think, you know, we're getting closer to HAL now. We're getting closer to people's original thought of what is AI, which was HAL 2000. So we're getting closer to that kind of experience where you don't think about what can I say, you don't think about how to vocalize it. You simply say, do you know that res recipe about making bone marrow gel? Just, really, really, really quick. Just, yeah. I wanted to underscore something you said, which is that the, the Julia Childs is she's a, like this archetype cook, right? She's there to help in the kitchen, and so by building a personality that's an archetype associated with cooking, you improve the user interface. So I just I think it's, I think it's a brilliant idea. Which archetype do we use? So I just underscore how I right. And as you <laughs> said the other day, be careful of the young Candy Valley because if you go there, then it gets creepy. So so I completely agree uh, that. that Personality is really important, and in terms of setting the context for what can this bot do, um, and, and we all have it, right? Like, you know, um, so I've been introduced myself, so you know, you know, at least something about what you can talk to me about. And I think bots need the same thing. Um, I don't. I, I love my Echo. Uh, I actually have two of them, um, but I don't think it's conversation. You know, there's a few exceptions. Uh, you can set a Google appointment, uh, a Google Calendar appointment that feels slightly conversational. But other than that, it's really command and intent. Doesn't uh, matter. Command and skill. I, I think it matters because um, it really limits how Alexa, um, and same thing actually goes for Siri, can get to know me. Um, and, 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 and if, if the bot, or well, actually both, and, and I can't get to know it. Right. So, because that's what conversation is all about. That's how you get to know, that's how you expand the conversation. You, you start having a very, very limited uh, discussion with someone, and as you learn more about them, you can have a broader conversation. That's what we need to have a conversational UI, in, in, in my opinion. So, it's, it's, there's obviously still limitations today, even though we've seen conversational user interfaces, voice user, user interfaces evolve um, pretty significantly over the past couple of years, and we, they're still limitations. So the question is, let me um, send this out to, to Mark. Over the next couple of years, let's say two to three years, what do you anticipate to be some of the further evolutions of UI and, and how might that be important to companies that are, that are looking to implement intelligent assistance or some other type of capability that's customer facing or 
Yeah, this, this question, like, what's it going to be like in three, mo three years is really, yeah. like, I asked that just a little bit ago. It's not a fair question. Who knows what's going to happen in a month? I, I think that, <laughs> yeah. I think that um, what I can say is that we currently have, you know, we can see that it is demonstrably possible to build conversational characters that are personality driven, that are running in virtual reality and augmented reality environments that can manipulate elements of the blockchain with voice only, right? And so I think what you were saying about text and sound and image as being these three key interface components is certainly the case. I will just put it out there that I think in three years, it will be quite common for us to have glasses. We'll put them down, not quite common, but I'm saying like, Within the Bay Area, there will be thousands of users that will be able <laughs> to, put, to put on a pair of glasses and talk to a character that is in an augmented reality environment right next to them. Because we can, we can do that and we have that running today. So how common will it be? How big of a market impact will it, be? Will it have? That's going to depend on things like marketing, business, and a lot of the stuff outside of the tech. I hope that's some valuable answer. I don't think that scenario will happen anytime soon, certainly not in the next three years, and here's why. Because it's forgetting in the human factor, right? So when Google came out with a glass, people were like, never on earth will I set this on, and the reason being that there, it, it impacts us on so many levels, right? The, the person on the other end, when they, you know, am I being filmed? Are you recording me right now? On the social level, it impacted so many things that the world is just not ready for that yet. Virtual reality is a step back in convenience to me and little added gain. Um, so to me, VR is a fad and will remain that for a number of years. You can quote me on that. I actually blogged about that. Um, <laughs> but wait, let me, let me be rude for gaming. For but Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go is augmented reality. That's, that's a little different. And, and the reason why that works is because that is not so awkward because you're essentially doing what you're already doing, which is walking through the streets with your phone. That took a little time <laughs> to get established, right? It took a few years. Initially, the people that had at first smartphones were like, oh, look at those guys. Now everyone does it. So that, got, we got used to it. The one device that came out that nobody understood um, was from Apple, the AirPods. The AirPods are not an EarPod with a cut cable. The AirPod are the only device, I think, that will succeed because it puts a virtual assistant in your ear. And they, they didn't make a big fuss about it, they didn't talk much about it, but it actually has Siri in your ear. Did anyone see the movie Her? Yes, so Her, <laughs> and I said Siri and she's responding. So Her is a fantastic movie from a design perspective, like how life could look like in maybe 10, 15 years. But when I posted that thought that I just uttered here on LinkedIn yesterday, I got a comment from an ex-colleague that I found interesting, he said, he, he agreed with me, and the reason he gave was interesting. He said, I also think that this thing could work versus VR goggles or Google Glass or anything else because sci-fi has actually shown us a lot of examples of this. A lot of sci-fi flicks are show, show, show us uh, little earpieces that, that help you, you know, answer questions. That was an interesting you know, argument to bring up, say, because sci-fi movies have shown it so much, it probably will succeed, versus we haven't seen a lot of you know, Google you know, Glass stuff. So I, I loved my Google Glass. Um, <laughs> Nerd. I, I take them on vacation with me. There's no better camera in the world. You go up to someone, or you see something really, and you go, and all of a sudden, you've got a picture, and maybe a slap in the face. But uh, I, I do love my Google Glass. I really do. Um, the, so the future, three years from now, uh, I'm sort of trying to create it right now in my house. So uh, I'm creating my own AI for the house using cognitive code because it develops incredibly fast and I can have stuff up and running in, in days. And uh, with, with Android, inexpensive Android devices in each room. So the next step is to tap into the TV and, and I've already got the, the stereo system tapped in. Um, but basically, I want to be able to go into any room in my house, and our AI happens to be named Dozer after my wife's past dog, and, uh, and, and, and so uh, you say, Dozer, you know, what's the weather today? Or read me my planner, um, and I, can, I want to be able to say, Dozer, what's on TV, or what channels the US open on, but I think, and, and by the way, 
nothing goes out to the cloud except the API call to get the information. The AI is in my house, the voice is in my house. So I don't worry even when I see things happening with, with things being hacked. And, and that's, I think, the future is that it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere you want to be. Uh, it's yours. It knows who you are. It has an afro, which is what you were talking about earlier. And, and that's, that's where I think we are in three years or earlier in my house. So did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I, I love the idea of, of, I think it was mentioned earlier today as well, the idea of having your own Metabot, basically. Like it's yours, your data and everything. I, I do think it's, it's a very hard problem to solve uh, because you know, uh, we have very few players that um, are willing to do all that work and not monetize it somehow. And, and, and we've seen um, something like mobile gaming, for instance, go completely to the freemium model um, to a point where you know, I can't find a, a good game to buy, even though I, I really don't like freemium that much. Um, so that's why I'm a little bit uh, hesitant that's going to happen. Um, I would say what you described that you're building at home uh, is, is you know, pretty close to how I see what we're going to deliver to our customers in the future. Um, we can deliver it now. And, and we certainly don't you know, share our data outside, outside of Comcast. Um, one thing I wanted to add is that this, this is really, um, for me at least, something about whenever you deliver a feature or a product, you have to delight. And guess what? You can't just build a product that delights the customer 5% more than what they're already using. So for us, that's the TV remote. That's been around for a long time. So every time we build a feature, um, we basically compare it to that. And we, you know, we have lots of features we built. And guess what? The remote won. Um, so we're very focused on how can we build something that delights so much that it actually changes the human behavior uh, of our customers. Yeah, I think that. You know, this, I really regret bringing up this notion of glass right now, I, and I apologize for being in the room for that. You know, I, it seems to me as though media generally, it layers on top of other media. You know, print hasn't really gone away. You know, the, even though there were apps, the websites are still out there. And I think that bots and assistants will, in a similar manner, kind of in a sedimentary manner, layer on top. But it also seems like media gets smaller, and it gets something, it always becomes things that, that we can touch. And we are able to manipulate them media elements faster, like photography, um, and it becomes more personalized. So it seems to me as though we will largely be followed around our houses or by our TVs by smaller and smaller particulate elements of conversation that work on that staircase of text to voice to graphic. And we'll be able to use them through thousands of different methods. I mean, this notion of a convergence is not what's happening. We're in an explosion. And I think the question is whether or not that audience that begins to surround us of these conversational agents, we will be surrounded by crowds of systems trying to sell to us and convince us and cajole us whether or not we can find methods of interface design that allows us to still maintain our own lives as the center. There, I think I found my answer. So, so, so <laughs> let, me, let me add that the one thing we're, that's not going to happen is that, and, and it's sort of trying to happen because everybody's got their own agenda. The one thing that's not going to happen is we're not going to have uh, an AI for this company and an AI for this company and an AI for this company. It's, it's, it's what's happening now. Every vendor, every shopping center, every retail store is creating their own AI. And that's going to fail because people are going to say, wait, I forgot how I react with this. And, and you know, Josie versus uh, Alaska versus, uh, you know, I can't think of all the female names that could be. but. Uh, that has no future because people want to have the same experience. People don't want to have to remember what experience to have with what. You, you're shaking your head. So you don't. You don't think that's true. I don't agree because okay. his comment was the whole experience is the experience disappears. I want the experience to be just when I go talk to anyone. I want them to understand it. That's that's the. Well, and also, like we're used to meeting hundreds and thousands of people, and every individual is different. So I remember exactly the relationship that I have with Dan Miller, right? I remember vaguely what, we're, what we've talked about, what I've shared, not well, we everything in detail, <laughs> right? But so I think um, having individual experiences with individual businesses is okay. 
I, I completely agree. Um, that's why I asked the question to Amazon is, is you know, I, I can't see myself having 20 devices around the home that, that, that are all to talk to stuff that is outside of my home. That doesn't seem to make sense. Um, so, you know, someone has to basically do what Apple and Google did for mobile phones. Give me one device that is my, that kind of device, and then allow other uh, uh, brands and, and companies that I want to have uh, a conversation with to be on that platform. And, and, and I don't think it'll work without that being a conversation with uh, a, an avatar with a personality because to my point before about you got to get to know this uh, bot um, and you, you don't want to if it doesn't have a personality. So that, that's the one thing I, I will say about Alexis, is, uh, Alexa is it, it, that's good in that people can, uh, stores can write their interfaces to it and it's the same interface all the time. I don't necessarily think it's the most beautiful interface, but yes, I like the fact that uh, whether it's the mall or it's the restaurant or whatever, I can say to Alexa, go get me a pizza or whatever. So I, I, I'm actually saying the opposite. That, okay. that, 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 that ba basically, if, if, you know, sure, think of Google, that's one interface for lots of things, so there will definitely be bots that are that. But um, if, 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 you want to ha if you have a company that you have a strong relationship with, that usually means you're, you're, you're paying them a lot of money, um, then they need to use all their data to give you a great experience. And there's no way that's going to happen through someone else's but this uh, is just interface the completely. You're talking about. No, but the interface is the conversation. So, so in other words, um, we have to create bots at Comcast that fully understands the, 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 the domains we're in so that we're the experts for the user for that domain. I can't see Alexa taking on that role for all domains. That's going to be an impossible task. No, Can I say uh, one more thing, or do you want to move on? Go ahead. Um, the, the idea of the meta bot, or the, you know, the personal assistant, I, I, it'll be quite some time until we can get there. And I don't like you know, companies like Viv um, go out there and promise the world again. You know, it, it won't work, and here's why. For a personal assistant to work, um, literally every company in the world or in the country or whatever would need to expose their data through APIs so that a personal assistant can interact with it. Chatbots, what we're doing now, I think are gonna be the leading theme for the next five to 10 years, and they're, they're a step, a, a step stone, you know, a, um, a step towards that vision. Um, because, you know, the, the ultimate interface is conversational. I think that's something we can all agree with. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, for the, so for, <laughs> anyway, yeah. <laughs> Conversational interface is a good, good idea, it's a good interface. Um, but so we need to first, you know, I, I, the analogy I want to bring up is the following. You know, back in the 90s, it took maybe, what, 10 years for mom and pop shop to realize they too might want a homepage on the web. It'll take a few years now for companies to realize they too might want a bot, okay? Um, until every company has a bot means they have exposed their data through a conversational interface only then can we even start thinking about something like a personal assistant, is, is my, my thinking. So, so what about, and I'm just throwing this out, because no, what about if, if the, if the um, data was in each different store of each different company, but the interface layer was on the device? So I, for me, it comes back to the conversation. Like, I can't imagine having one person that I have all types of conversations with. Um, you know, if I, if I want a good steak, I go to the butcher that I usually go to and he knows me and he knows what I want, um, so I get a good steak. And, 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 I, and if I, you know, go to, to uh, I've got a problem with uh, plumbing, I go to the plumber bot and it just knows that this is the third time uh, this month. So, it, it, you know, that, that's, that's what I think is it, it's so important about. This is about conversation and relationships with those bots that build up over time, and that's how they can deliver. A bot is gonna have a hard time delivering what you want the first time you talk to it. So let's so, just see if there's any questions. And you got the mic, okay. Wally's first then, uh, Christian, is this on? Christian, I really appreciate what you just said, because I think you're absolutely right. The issue is that it's task specific it's domain specific. The mortuary bot is gonna be very different from the comedy bot, and hopefully. But I wanna jump, I, I jump to, uh, 
to just something about the uncanny valley for a second, because this is something that disturbs me a lot. And I, I, as a, a designer, I would love to have beautiful photorealistic avatars all the time. As a designer, I also understand that within a second and a half of any voice interaction, a respondent can tell you what that voice personality looks like physically. They can describe them down to the color of their shoes, and we've actually had that happen. What concerns me is that, I, I don't know if any of you saw that I Will Destroy Humans video of the, the robot lately. That was, there, uh, anyway. Um, I just worry that you get too close and it's not quite right. And I, I think speech is going to be the way we go forward for a long time because it's much easier to convey a character without causing any issues. And I just wanted the panel to just respond to that. Speech first for so, quite a so while. One of the great things that I, one of the reasons I, I joined Cognitive Code after I sold Linguisist is uh, Leslie, who's in the back there, his background is in gaming. And he developed this AI. So he's extremely aware of the Uncanny Valley. And so if you look, look at, the, at the applications we're showing at our booth, there's no doubt this is a character with a capital CH. This is not an attempt to fool you into thinking it's a human. But it's an attempt to give you a wonderful experience at the same time delivering whatever message or information we're trying to deliver. It enhances the experience. Now, you know, so, so, so and I wanted to throw out something else because what you said also, and I haven't pre-thought this, this is just throwing it out. Um, if you had an interface, and this is a conversation about interfaces, where as a vendor I could throw to this interface my profile that I want to use and the data I want to use, then I could have a mortuary profile that does that when it's time for that, and I could have a, a comedy profile that has Henny Youngman coming up when I want to. I just said, this is a thought to answer what you were saying earlier. Yeah. You know, there, we found a lot of different uncanny valleys. Um, we've had the luck to work with folks that did like Gollum, you know, to make some incredibly good looking photorealistic avatars. Um, and we've also built avatars that have no resemblance to the human face. Um, we found that the Uncanny Valley also dwells in the sound of the voice. Uh, it, by the way, is everyone, does anyone not know what the Uncanny Valley is? Okay. Uncanny, I know. Well, Uncanny Valley, is, as it approaches human likeness, it becomes disturbing, and you begin to realize subconsciously it's an effect that, oh, I'm talking to a zombie. Um, in any case, we found that this effect, this effect is visual. It's uh, also auditory. It's also lexical. There are psychological uncanny valleys. There are uncanny valleys of timing, of intonation, and prosody. We are living in a landscape of uncanny valleys as we develop these things, right? So let's stop thinking about, oh, let's recreate people. Like, let's not try to make the avatar photorealistic. Let's stop insulting the user. This is a human. You're talking to a human. No. The reason why, and I talked to Tony Steers, who is one of the designers of R2-D2, he, Ralph McQuarrie, and George Lucas had developed R2-D2 as a contrast, a comedy contrast to C-3PO, who was after Fritz Lang's Metropolis gold character. And, and while they were brainstorming, they're like, what's the opposite of this like glistening humanoid future person? And one of them took a trash can and put it upside down. <laughs> And then they're like, all right, and how do we then build the comedy contrast of the foil against that character? And they give R2-D2 this like beep, 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 kind of like a pet. or Like you know it's got emotion, you know it's thinking, you can see it, but it's not acting like a person. So therefore, it's not, it doesn't have the sort of, um, you know, uh, imperialist attitude that C-3PO carries around. It means then that you can interact with a character because you know it's a robot and it's the most popular robot on the planet because it looks somehow so unlike us that like an animal we can identify with it. So please, let's stop trying to make our characters look photorealistic. Let's dwell with one another and enjoy our photorealism as we talk to each other. And let's use our abilities as designers to present <coughs> archetypes that visually represent what the personality is so that the user interface is clear. Because otherwise we're gonna be talking to a lot of uncanny valleys of a lot of ugly avatars, it's like a zoo of Fucking zombies, right? <laughs> like, let's please, like, make things that are beautiful, that are creative, that display that personality so that the user knows how to interface with it, and let's leave humans for being human-like. And you look pretty HD, by the way. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm high-res today. So, okay, one, one last question. One last question. 
Uh, I'm Sergey Burkov from Altera.ai. Uh, don't you think that in this discussion we are missing another new interface that is growing like a weed as we speak? And I mean this is the interface of messenger bots as they exist today in Facebook Messenger and WeChat uh, in Kik. And those bots are not conversational and not intelligent at all. It's a screen full of buttons. It's more like IVR or web uh, in Nokia 7000 series. And actually it's growing and at least it took China. In China, in WeChat, all the bots are not conversational. They are this dumb like brick screens full of buttons. Uh, it's like menu for Windows 3.1 application. <laughs> and still, one billion Chinese are using it, and eight million businesses in China have such uh, concierges or bots. So what do you think about this interface? Is, is it really going to take root here in, in this country like it did in China, and maybe it will take over all our beautiful conversational and intelligent <laughs> assistance. It seems to work, so, right? Yeah. So and, I would say whatever works. Right. The appendage is yeah. answer yes or no. <laughs> so I'm already done. It seems to work, so it must be okay. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, certainly the, the numbers are, are showing that this is, this is happening. Um, I would say, though, that that's what I call a command and intent bot, um, and, and, and it's not a conversation, and I think it's kind of like early generation, they're easy to build. Facebook went out and said, you don't have to use our wit.ai, you can just use the command and intent. I think that's why we're seeing so many of them. I think they will be able to do more for us if they use uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, I, this, this I think that was more of a political statement than a, a, converse, a question. So I'm gonna say, if anybody wants to talk about Trump versus Hillary afterwards, I'll, I'll be at the other end of the... <laughs> The strategy looks to me to be very much like Google did in 1998. How do we aggregate user data and how do we put it into a single funnel? The money lives in the database. How do we collect as much of that data as we can from our end users? Bots are now what the search engines of the 1990s were. We can aggregate more services, therefore we can collect more user data. Therefore, the database gets richer. Okay, great. Well, that wraps up that panel and let's uh, thank the panelists.